Hi, everyone. You're listening to the Blockchain Socialist Podcast. And for today, I have uh, someone you may have heard of on Twitter. He goes by Chain Left. He is potentially my digital doppelganger, but we'll talk about that. Um, but he's been involved in some really interesting things over the past that I've, I've sort of seen him uh, get involved in uh, through Twitter and through uh, especially NFTs. Um, and he recently also started his own NFT collection, which has a really, really interesting uh, mechanism behind it. And so I really wanted to have him on so that we can talk about it. He's also done some interesting analyses on the differences between proof of work and proof of stake. Um, and so we wanted to talk about some of these things for today's episode. But maybe to start off, we can just start really, really um, bluntly. If you want Chain Left, if you can introduce yourself for those who may not know you and explain if you are my digital doppelganger or not. Yeah, we, we sort of are. So uh, yeah, hi. So my name is Chain Left. Thank you for having me, Blockchain Socialist um, or TBS. We are... Uh, so yeah, my name is Chain Left. I'm uh, originally from a uh, Middle Eastern country. I uh, was lucky, lucky enough that I had a... Uh, in education and, and became a data scientist and, and left uh, my country early on. And I, I moved, uh, I traveled in a bunch of different places. I lived in different places. Right now I'm based in Central Europe. And yeah, I'm originally a data scientist, but I got into crypto around uh, 2017 and NFTs more around uh, first half of last year in 2021. And uh, the main, I guess, attraction for me uh, on, on NFTs and in general, uh, blockchain was really the smart contracts. So I wasn't really that much interested in, you know, Bitcoin early on. Uh, but I really got started interested in uh, smart contracts because that kind of, uh, I, I saw that it can actually lead to a lot of interesting things. And we're seeing now those uh, things being done, right? Like we're seeing artists getting royalties and payments and we're seeing DAOs being formed. And I know uh, you are actually doing a lot of work uh, there as well that, you know, with the bread chain and, and other uh, organizations. So, uh, so yeah, uh, I think there are a lot of interesting things for a leftist in, uh, in, in blockchain space uh, beyond the speculation that we see. And yeah, that's what got, really got interesting for me. I, uh, from the early on, like since my childhood, really, like I was interested in art as well. Um, actually, uh, you know, I, I dabbled in a few things uh, when uh, I was uh, living in London. I, I did some photography and, and some uh, very few street art pieces as well, actually. Um, hopefully they're still in London in some of the walls uh, there. Um, and uh, since I my background is in data science and in coding, I also got a lot involved in generative art and then, you know, build, like doing art with code, right? And, and this is kind of where what I've been doing recently as well. Nice. Yeah. So then, uh, yeah, I think for a lot of people who have joined in the crypto world on the left, has, it has been sort of the uh, application of smart contracts that I think has become sort of the, the more interesting stuff than it was with like Bitcoin being sort of digital gold. Yeah. Or like trying to make a hard money type of thing. Um, yeah. But I thought it was really funny when I first found your account. I was like, chain left. I was like, I was like, that could have been like one of the many names that I probably wrote down as like potential names for my for my platform or something like that because yeah. I just like couldn't I couldn't think of one. Um, but yeah, I think it's funny. Uh, you know what, what? Why did you choose that name? That's funny because um, I actually the original name of my account was I think blockchain leftist. I think. Uh, like uh, so, this is obviously an alt account, right? I, I had the Twitter account that I used for more political, uh, let's say, follows and, and and deep, really deep into leftist uh, follows and and uh, posting. I had it like you know much earlier on, but I created this account specifically, I think, in 2021, early 2021. Um, yeah, so I actually picked the name blockchain leftist at the time, uh, leftist being more, I would say, I guess, trying to be a little inclusive. Uh, so, you know, I know that in crypto space, we see a, a more a right-leaning uh, crowd, right? I mean, uh, at least at least originally. Uh, I think recently that's changing a lot. And uh, by calling it leftist, the idea was 
well, that's the inclusion, right? It can include anarchists, it can include, you know, Marxists, even tankies, you know. So the idea was like, uh, you know, be appeal to a bit of uh, a wider audience and make sure that, you know, I can actually highlight the these use cases between uh, that is inside crypto that appeals to left uh, leftist view. So that was the main reason. Uh, and then I thought blockchain leftist was too long, so I made it chain leftist, and then it, it kind of stuck to chain left eventually. Um, I discovered, I think, your account maybe end of last year, uh, and I was like, okay, well, this was done before. That was obvious. <laughs> kind of, someone, <laughs> someone is doing it better than me already. So, you know. Sorry. So, so yeah, that was. That we could always use more. I don't mind. <laughs> yeah, I know. I mean, uh, I think we will. Uh, I mean, there are now now that we've adopted this open, you know, openly leftist accounts in Twitter. Uh, you're meeting, I'm sure, as well, and I'm now meeting also a lot of other leftist people who are into crypto. So that's actually, uh, they're actually like people are, a lot of people are actually leftists, but they're kind of almost hiding because of the yeah. mass, like the, you know, general. The within, expectation. Yeah, right. <laughs> I mean, within the crypto, it's from both sides. Like within crypto world, you have all these like right leaning people who dislike leftists, maybe. And then you have leftists who really dislike crypto. So people are not really that vocal about their uh, their views essentially uh, so i think having these accounts is useful because you know people people are dming me on, oh i'm actually leftist as well <laughs> or or some leftists are actually dming and saying oh that sounds actually interesting you know even though they wouldn't write it publicly on twitter so that's right. yeah that's an interesting thing yeah yeah i've 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 definitely had the the same experience where i think just yeah, being open about sort of my stance has sort of helped other people uh, feel willing or able to um, profess their own political views that doesn't necessarily align with the rest of crypto or, you know, vice versa, like you said. Yeah. Which has been really interesting to see. Um, I think part of, I think part of that for us, at least both of us being kind of pseudo anonymous kind of helps with uh, like being able to do that. Because I feel like I, I wouldn't have done it if I had put like my real my real face on it. Yeah, probably me neither. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it would be more difficult. Yeah. But yeah, so I'm curious. Um, I imagine like you got into NFTs, I imagine because it sort of combined your two interests, both in data science and already having this interest in art and uh, having already uh, made street art in London, for example. Yeah, but I, I wouldn't call like that. I did. I, I did like uh, three or something <laughs> things that are actually. That's more. That's that's more than me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but uh, yeah. Uh, so, I mean, you know, you don't have to be an artist to 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 enjoy art, of course. But uh, uh, yeah, to me, to me, I think it really appealed to me that the NFT. If we're if we're specifically speaking about NFTs. Uh, I think to me, it really appealed to me that artists were finally getting paid, right? Like that's that finally mm. stress on the finally part, because, uh, you know, we, you see that there is not a really a lot of successful models for artists to really make money. Um, mm. And, you know, we're seeing over and over a lot of cases in the over the past years. And that applies to all types of art, by the way, like music, visual arts. Um, and I feel like this element of, uh, ownership. I mean, if we're living in the world where there is an ownership, right? I mean, it, this is there is a lot of debate about this, right? I mean, is is that a good thing already? And there are lots of articles mm -hmm. about it. Whether you know NFT making things uh, more ownership focused is a good thing or a bad thing, and 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 we can have these debates. I think it's a healthy debate. Um, but if we are living in a world of ownership, and if we're not you know, completely, uh, you know, toppling the capitalism. I think it is fair for artists to have a livelihood based on this ownership structure. So, um, mm. and, and there is, there are lots of researches and studies on the fact that people do enjoy art when they actually own it. There is like actual study about it. So, um, you know, the cool thing about NFTs is that, and, and, and this is actually a criticism of NFT, but I actually like that it's, it's a feature in my opinion, not a bug, that anyone can right click save it, right? So anyone can actually right. look at it and, and enjoy it. But someone else who actually has the means and, and uh, money, they can actually pay for it and own it. And, and they will have an additional sense of happiness with that payment. So 
everyone enjoys it, but the ownership provides value to artists and to collector as well. So I feel like it's almost like a triple win scenario with, with this structure. Um, and again, like I'm saying, like in a world where there's no ownership, we wouldn't have this. But uh, when, when there is this uh, already paradigm of ownership, I think that actually provides a really good, uh, almost a, like a workaround. Hmm. So that's what I really enjoyed, I think, about it. Um, people getting paid and artists getting paid. Also the royalties, obviously. Uh, that's, that's I think, an additional. I was very vocal about my support for royalties as well recently. Like, there was this debate about it. Yeah. Uh, there have been debates. So, yeah, I mean, uh, th- that was, I think, the appeal for me, the NFTs. I never really got into too much on the PFP hype. Like, I've never once even had a... A profile picture that was a an NFT actually. So it's no, all my, you've never got a board ape. <laughs> yeah, not no board ape or. <laughs> or you've never stolen a board ape. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, never. Yeah, and uh, and not even like you know any other uh, you know PFP project. It's my own drawing, like uh, my my PFP. Uh, I I don't get that model to be honest. Uh, you know, the, mm. the, I know people talk about this community element and. And I don't know, some, some people call like a startup kind of fundraising element, but I, I, I don't see it personally. Uh, to me, it mm. feels a little, you know, a, a community purely driven by financial motive doesn't feel like a very robust community to me. Uh, to me, it should be based on a value. So, you know, there are a few projects like that that have both, like both financial motive and uh, some sort of specific value, like those women-led projects or... or uh, environment related projects so so maybe maybe these will have better future long term i don't know uh, but yeah but for me it was more about art always so i've been more focused on the art side of it nice yeah i think um i think it's it, it has been just such a weird conversation especially in the very beginning with nfts um just like i've mentioned this before but like kind of like idiots on one side and idiots on the other saying like you know uh this, this is my picture. You can't copy it. You know, it's not yours. It's my property. It's my digital property because it's on the blockchain. And then other people saying like, ha ha, I stole your property because I, you know, right click saved it. You know, it's like the dumbest conversation. Yeah. It's, like, it's, it's mind numbing. Like when you <laughs> hear these do people you, talk. Do you know that when I, when I was discussing with some uh, NFT, let's call it NFT, NFT hater, when I was speaking to some NFT haters and that happened like more than five, maybe 10 times, they would uh, copy paste my PFP and post it back to me saying that, oh, look, I, I stole your NFT. And I'm saying, this is not an NFT. It's my own drawing. Like, feel free to do whatever <laughs> you want with it. It's not, you know, it's, uh, it's, it is really, uh, you know, it's fun. <laughs> I mean, just uh, at some point it becomes really uh, annoying, of course, but yeah. Yeah. And your, your, your PFP, it's like, it's Karl Marx with like a cloak, no? Yeah, uh, with a cloak and and some GM on it, and, and it's pixel art as well. So I I, I drew myself mm. on, on a pixel. Some real art. some real crypto leftist uh, art right there. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, there were different versions of it. During the Christmas, I put a Santa Claus hat on it, and uh, when I now nice. now I think it's one the one with kids. Like I have you know because now I have a new baby, so you know. Uh, right. Congrats. Kids. Yeah. Thanks. So yeah. <laughs> I keep changing it basically, but it's it's my own drawing so nice yeah and then i think you've also helped a lot with um if i understand it correctly you helped uh jonathan mann a lot the yeah. song a day guy yeah we uh i mean uh, i don't know a lot but uh like he he asked uh, if i could uh, analyze some data produce some charts uh, from uh, his song a day archive essentially um he wanted to put it into some sort of, I think, maybe an article or maybe maybe, maybe a book. Um, mm-hmm. And uh, so, so yeah, we did a lot of uh, some analysis basically through his uh, data. Like he had a lot of, he, is, he kept really good record of what he's done. Like uh, not just the, you know the songs and names and stuff, but like the the the, the melody, the, the the length, the tempo, like all of that were stored in the in the database. So he had a very clean data set already to begin with. So I cleaned it like up. Like he had that all on like Excel or something yeah, like yeah, that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. It, yeah, that's amazing actually. Like the, the I mean, the, the guy is, you know, like he's really dedicated to what he's doing. So it's really cool. Mm-hmm. And um, yeah, he's, uh, so so I cleaned the data a little bit more. It was not, not fully clean, but it was pretty clean, I think, for 
-hmm. Like if you, <laughs> that's maybe a, a sidebar, but like, you know, data science, people say like, yeah. oh, it's a glorify, like, oh, data science, it's actually 90% data cleaning. But, uh, you know, so, <laughs> so, uh, so in this case, though, it was really very little data cleaning and more like visualization and producing That's charts. so nice. Yeah, because that in my experience, whenever I did data analysis for like the projects or work or something like that, it was, yeah, a lot of data cleaning. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> just spending like weeks and weeks of doing it. But yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. So yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, his his work is you know I think it's pretty cool and, and it speaks for himself. Um, he has really good songs. Um, yeah, so I was uh, really happy to get involved with him. He also gifted me a song after that, so that was also nice mm. of him. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, I think it's um, <clears throat> it's always nice to hear whenever, um, I don't know, people using their skills just for for like these types of efforts for outside of like a normal work context. It's always nice to to be able to do that. I, I I'd say for at least for me, like I feel much better about using my skills for for something like this than I do, of course, when I'm like working for a corporation. I think yeah, a course. lot of people can sort of uh, relate to that. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Yeah, I, I, I used data science a few times like in, in NFT space. I used it for, um, so I'm involved in this uh, a historical NFT community called Punicodes and, and I created a database for them as well, like uh, scraping the, the, the name coin blockchain and producing the the categories for 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 those assets and so on so you know so it's it's always good like to to you know i think use it in this context that something that you enjoy rather than something mm. like you know making someone else some corporation money <laughs> so yeah. yeah of course um and so now recently i reached out um originally because you had started a your own nft project which you called very um very spicily, uh, Art Ponzi, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> in all caps, yeah. Art Ponzi. Um, and so I was wondering if maybe you can just explain to us um, what Art Ponzi is and how does it differ from most other NFT collections, since it does have a much different mechanism than like, you know, for example, people think of NFTs with like 10,000 profile picture types of collections or like, yeah. it's, it's, it's a bit, it's quite different than that. Yeah. So this is more uh, like a, almost like a passion project that's, is supposed to fund what I want to do next, to be honest. So uh, mm. uh, Art, Art Ponzi is, uh, uh, and, and I, I really, I'm really enjoying this, actually doing this collection. I'm doing something every week, well, at least trying to do every week. Maybe it might go longer for some cases. Uh, so the difference with Art Ponzi, of Art Ponzi from other collections is that, first of all, it's not a generative collection. It's, a, it's you know, each work is a manual uh, production. So, so I do each piece with myself without any, you know, generation or anything like that. I do use coding, but I'll come to that. Um, and uh, so the mechanics is different and, and also the, it's in the name. And, and like you said, I call it spicily art puns in all capitals on purpose. Because uh, so when you look at the, the artists in NFT space right now, uh, they are, you know, either producing one of one works, right? And they're selling it on super rare or foundation or something. And, or they're doing a lot of sometimes generative works and they're, you know, sending over as well. But uh, then you have some artists who are one of one artists normally who sell tokens. And what they do is that they sell these, uh, they call it art token. And they sell, for example, like 50 of them. And after selling that, they produce an artwork and airdrop this artwork to its holders every week. So every week uh, or, or every month, depending on their speed, uh, they deliver a new artwork for their collectors. And that basically that art token is a, is a mechanism used for airdrops. Mm -hmm. So what I wanted to do, so this mechanism, of course, as you can see, there, there, involves some, there is some trust involved in this, right? Because you expect to get a new uh, artwork. Like there is no artwork in the beginning. There is just a token. And then you start right. receiving the artwork. It's like a right, it's kind of a promise to a future artwork that yeah, will be given to you. Yeah, exactly. So what yeah. I wanted to do was a little bit different. I wanted to do it, it still involves trust, obviously, and, and I, I refuse to call anything that says 100% trustless. <laughs> Everything, even in blockchain, is, it involves some level of trust. But uh, there is still some art, uh, trust involved in my mechanism, but I think much less than this mechanism, the to 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 art token mechanism that has been talked about. What I do is that I do an, an artwork every week and I 
drop the 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 new artwork to the previous holders but that new artwork that i produced will also be used for an airdrop for the next artwork that i'm going to produce so mm-hmm. uh, and this is where the ponzi mechanism as we would call it comes in because uh, the first artwork was one of one and the second one was an addition of one of two. So one piece went into went into the auction, and the second uh, the, the second edition uh, was airdropped to the holder of the first uh, first NFT. Mm-hmm. And now I just actually minted the third piece, and one of the, those it, it will be three editions, and one of those editions will be uh, auctioned, and the remaining two will be airdropped to the previous holders. And why there is less trust involved in this is that because every single piece is an artwork itself. So by by buying it, you're actually buying the art itself, but that also becomes a token for the next airdrop. So there's still some trust involved because you expect to receive an airdrop, but it's less Mm -hmm. so because the token itself is an artwork as well. It includes an artwork. And I called it Art Ponzi, of course, because there is this almost like a pyramid level structure but actually, uh, uh, you know, from the very beginning, I made it clear that at number 10, we will stop. So there is no more, you know, everlasting promise or anything like that. At, at 10th, after the 10th drop, uh, the 10th, 10th uh, piece will be 10 editions and one of them will be again auctioned and nine of them will be airdropped to the ninth pieces holders. And finally, after the 10th piece is done, I'll actually have hopefully enough money to fund my next project, which I already half finished. And uh, and in that collection, 10 pieces will be airdropped to the holders of the 10th piece in Art Ponzi. And that's the end of it. And at that point, uh, I'll ask my collectors, basically, what should we do next? Should we start a new cycle, you know, uh, a new cycle of 1 to 10? And what we can do this time is that actually we can actually bring in other art- artists, right? So we can actually maybe like mm. other artists can join to the community. They can auction their own works or if they want, they can actually just keep the token and almost like a art exchange between other artists, right? So you can actually, for example, you're an artist that comes here and then you produce your first work and then the second edition will be, second piece will be two editions and one of the that will be another artist who will keep their piece and airdrop one piece to you. So it's almost like an artist art swap kind of thing can happen as well in the mm. future iterations. So, so you know, there are a lot of ideas like that where it can go, but I want that part to be determined after the 10th piece and after I deliver all the promises I made and the community decides basically together. I don't want to be the sole decision maker at that point. Right. So it's really interesting. I mean, so you're... Basically, the the earlier you are into the art Ponzi, the more art you will receive. Yes. Um, as part of a collection, uh, and then by the end of it, it goes up to ten. Uh, basically, it sounds like to me like some people will say like, "Oh, you're basically just creating a DAO. Like, you're creating like art Ponzi DAO a bit, or you're allowing for that potentially to form if if that's what people wanted." Yes, I mean, I, I, my, you know, if if everything worked amazingly and if everything works perfectly, yeah, that would be amazing. If there could be a DAO eventually, where uh, you know, holders of you know the Art Ponzi collection can actually make these decisions together. I mean, I'll do that anyway without forming a DAO, but uh, you know, because mm-hmm. like I said, I want the holders to to decide what happens next, uh, and I'd be happy to you know work towards building it further with creating you know making those different mechanisms that I mentioned, maybe the new, getting new artists on board and so on. But, you know, it's also, I don't want to be the sole decision maker at that point. I just wanted to make it clear that the promise of it ends at number 10 and it's not a forever lasting Ponzi or anything like that because you know, <laughs> I, I can't, you know, put myself under that. Yeah. So it's not, it's not really a Ponzi, but it takes the shape of a, of a pyramid yeah. similar to like, yeah. you know, pyramid schemes and Ponzi's and things yeah, like that. Yeah, exactly. So, and, and that's the joke there a little bit as well. Like I, you know, it, it is a Ponzi after all, uh, until 10th dropped. And then at that point, it's not a Ponzi anymore. But, uh, mm-hmm. and since, since I, uh, hopefully, since I'm making it clear, hopefully it's not a real Ponzi, <laughs> hopefully. <laughs> right, right. I, I wonder, like a question that I have is whether or not, do you think, that there will be more rarity for the piece that is auctioned off versus the pieces that were airdropped? 
Um, well, the because it's an ERC one one five five eleven fifty five, because of that, it's an additions contract. So technically, there is no difference between you know, let's say, let's talk about piece number five, for example. Technically, there is no difference between that one piece that was auctioned versus the other four that are airdropped. Like in the token itself. Yeah, in the token itself. Or so the contract. But yeah. like in the, the history of that piece. But even that, like you can't differentiate that on OpenSea, for example. Like, you know, the token ID is the same even. So mm. you can't really differentiate that. I, I mean, we can... For example, I will give an example. There is a historical NFT collection called Curio Cards, and it's a ERC. Well, I think it's no, actually, it was I think ERC twenty, and then it changed. I'm not sure, but basically, um, that collection uh, has editions, and there is no really premium of because you know in in the historical NFT community, it's really important the timestamps, right? Like which one is earlier and so on. And yeah. clearly, some of those editions were minted before the some of the others. But there is no easy way to see it on any interface or even even on blockchain. I'm not sure. Well, probably some, there is somewhere to notice it in the blockchain by looking at the the chain of events, basically from how it changed hands from wallet to wallet. Essentially, you can probably detect that. But it's very difficult. And today, at least, there is no premium for those that are uh, you know uh, time stamped earlier because there is no easy way to detect mm. that. Uh, but yeah, okay, okay. for the for the uh, for the other ones, I mean, for the for, for this case as well, I, I doubt that it will be at least anytime soon. Mm, okay, I'm just curious. Um, and so, what is also interesting about like this whole collection that you're doing um, that you sort of alluded to is that all of the art is stored 100% on chain, from what I understand. Yeah. Um, and so that means that there is, as far as I understand, and correct me if I'm wrong, that there is no type of like URL in the metadata like most other no. like NFT art pieces where you have like a link to an IPFS or yeah. a link to, if 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 you got a shitty one, and link to an HTTP uh, type of link. Yeah, no. Um, but no, yeah, no. could you explain what, what, what that looks like? Because then also just a side note that, that, you know, a lot of people have this misunderstanding that an NFT is just sort of like a link, you know, to a URL. Yeah. But anyways. Yeah. So I think about 95% of NFTs are linked to a URL, but out of those, I would say 50% is linking to at least IPFS. So IPFS mm. is, you know, interplanetary file system. You you have a, a relatively, let's say, decentralized way to permanently store uh, assets. Even then, it's not 100% permanent because you have to pin it and stuff. There's lots of technicals involved, but uh, yeah. it, it is a fairly good solution, in my opinion. Um but yeah, like the other 50% is, uh, I think, even like things like board apes and so on, they're just linked to a, a file in a server that is controlled by the, you know, that company. Uh, so that's that's, a, that's a really not a good mechanism. Um, the the ideal way, the, the best, most, most ideal way, I guess, is to have things stored on the chain. So, uh, for example, when you have, when you look at things like art blocks, the, probably the most popular art project, they actually have a way to immutably or let's say they have a way to keep the artwork permanent uh, thanks to blockchain what they do is that they store the code that produces the output on chain so they use mm. for example like if you're using uh, J like javascript or processing some sort of you know those generative uh, art languages if you're using those uh, they store them on the blockchain so that if something happens to the file that is actually stored in the server because if you look at the blockchain, art blocks, artworks are actually stored on art blocks' own website, but they at least also store the code. So that means that if something happens to art block server, someone else can just run that code that is stored on the chain mm -hmm. and reproduce the output. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, there are still some issues. For example, they don't store the libraries. So if something happens to the programming language, then it's not permanent and stuff. It goes into mm -hmm. all levels of on chain nerdiness, basically, at that point. What yeah. I do is that I want to have zero dependency. So no dependency on a programming language, no dependency on, on any server, anything, basically. I want to actually store the media file on the chain. So all you need is either a browser or not even a browser. If you have an SVG viewer program, whatever, basically, it would run and show you the artwork that I'm producing, essentially. So that's the difference mm. between, um, I guess, on-chain artworks and... Uh, you know, off-chain. There are different levels of dependencies, and I think 
mine is probably the the the, the most uh, permanent or most immutable version. There are a few of those projects, by the way, that does this uh, as as immutable and as mine. So I'm not the first for sure. Mm. And so, like, is it? I mean, was it expensive to like mint to mint these types of art pieces because of you know, directly using a media file on chain. Yeah, normally it is. Uh, so if I were to try to store something like a, a, a GIF file or PNG, JPEG file, any sort of rastering, uh, you know, rastering file type, that would cause, yeah, like, uh, you know, thousands and millions probably. But I'm using a file type called SVG. And this kind of the other thing that I'm trying to uh, kind of highlight in my collection as well uh, so SVG is a really cool file type. So, you know, everyone yeah. needs to learn about this. Like, I'm going to get very nerdy <laughs> now because yeah. SVG is, uh, unlike the raster type file type, raster file type, so, you know, it doesn't work with pixels. It works with uh, mathematical coordinates and, and uh, like, it's almost like a code, essentially. Like, you have a, uh, you have almost like, uh, you have an output that shows the, the coordinates of where the line should go from one place to another or what type of circle you're drawing and stuff like that. And it's recognized mm -hmm. by all browsers. It's recognized by different SVG view programs. So, you know, it's a it's pretty future-proof, let's say, programming, or not programming language, but file type. Mm -hmm. And it, it allows also really cool things, right? Because it's done mathematically and algorithmically, it can scale infinitely. So when you zoom into any PNG or JPEG or even GIF file, when you zoom in, it will start to get pixelated because that's how it works. It's pixelated. But with SVGs, when you zoom in, it just continues to scale. So it's infinitely scalable. And now, mm -hmm. you know, when we're talking about things like metaverse and stuff like that, and I don't know where these things are going to go, but, you know, imagine that you have a, uh, you know, I don't know how our lives will be in 50 years, but in, in 50 years, if you have a metaverse uh, sky, let's say, you can actually essentially put that uh, artwork on the sky and it will be infinitely high quality as it is on a small frame. And, and mm. that's the advantage, right? Like you can put it on your TV at home, you can put it on the metaverse sky, you can put it on a small frame and it will still have the same quality as it's small or high uh, or, mm. or, la or large. Um, the other thing is that I'm doing exclusively glitch art and animated art, basically on on SVG, and this is, I think, the unique part in what I'm doing. I think very few people have done uh, SV animated SVGs uh, in mm -hmm. in NFT space, especially. Uh, we mostly see those like static ones, and uh, there is no frame loss as well, right? You you have those uh, movie files or MP4 and so on. They're usually limited with frames. You have like 25, 25, you know frames per second and so on. This one is infinite again. So if you actually slow it down or, or do anything like that, it will have the infinite frame between one frame and another. Does that make sense? Mm, right. Because it's programmatically done, it's again, uh, you know, any there is no frame loss between an animation. So there is no, you know, um, let, let's try to, for anyone who's interested in glitch art, if you if you look at glitch arts, it's usually mostly like let's say thirty frames bought in together. So you have thirty frames jumping across each other, and it's creating this glitch effect. And it's it's really cool. Of course, I love it. Uh, but it's like you can you know you can go to up to thirty. Okay, let's say like really insane artists go to the level of hundred frames. But in my works, it's like infinite frames, right? It's it's like uh, you know there is no there is no frame loss between a one shot versus the other. And that's again something really right. cool about SVGs because it doesn't really work in frames. Like yeah, it, it works with mathematically. So it all right. you know when you stop it, it will stop, <laughs> and and you will see it in that you know exact frame. Yeah, and and of course because it's SVG format, because it's all coded and algorithmic and everything, it's also super small file, and then I can store it on Ethereum itself, and uh, it's essentially a text, right? What I store on the it's a text, but it's recognized mm. by browsers to turn into a, a visual art piece. And that allows us to, um, you know, I store, it, it, it still costs, so to be honest, like it still costs a bit. Like, for example, uh, the, the one I minted today, I caught a, uh, 
Gray at four today, so I mm. minted it uh, with only forty dollars. Bear market is helping me actually to to mint things f- f- cheaply, relatively. <laughs> if I were to mint this last year, it would cost me like two three thousand dollars. Even even this wow. you know small file. Mm. So that's also another. Pro- thing. Maybe that's why it hasn't been used still so much yet. I mean, people could have done it years ago before the NFT uh, hype right. last year, but nobody did. Um, so yeah, I, I really enjoy this. It gets really nerdy, like when I go into the no no uh, bits of it. But SVG is really cool. You can do like for example, my new piece today that I minted. Uh, it's it's called Merge Left. It's depicting merge actually, and it allows me to do like pretty much an on chain story, visual story. Like I I have scenes. Like I have a proof mm-hmm. of work scene. Then there is a merge scene, and then there is a there is a uh, there is a proof of stake scene. And that proof of stake scene lasts forever after that. So you kind of can do the things that you can't do with GIF or other media files. Right. Um, so, so a lot of I think firsts in my collection actually, like I, like on chain glitch art, longest animated NFT. I think the second my second piece dropless was I think the longest animated NFT so far. Um, this third piece will be probably the I'm not sure, but probably um, the first. Uh, never ending nft that is not a loop like because normally you have loops but this is not a loop it it starts with a frame with a scene second scene and the third scene and that third scene lasts forever so a lot of niche firsts i would say in this collection and i hope to continue that tradition in the coming pieces as well yeah it's very cool so like the if i understand correctly um like inside the svg file you have it planned to where the SVG itself changes. Mm-hmm. Um, so, it's, so it's, I mean, it, one, it is changing through the glitch art, yeah. but then it is changing through like the base, like animation yeah. that that's happening on it. Yeah. Um, and so like through that, this next one that, or the one that I guess you said you've minted today, it's telling the story of like the transition from proof of work to proof of stake on Ethereum. Yeah. On chain on Ethereum. Yeah, exactly. And it's, it's cool because like, you know, you, you have, the piece starts with proof of work and then there's a merge and then proof of stake. But then it always stays proof of stake. So it's not like, you know, you, you have three seconds to see that proof of work. And from that onward, you won't be able to see it. And then it will always be proof of stake after that mm-hmm. point. But I guess you could just take the SVG code that you have in the contract yeah. and replay that if you wanted to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can do that, of course. Yeah. Right. But as far as like on-chain, what is it right now it is different. Yeah. And then, uh, you know, the second piece, for example, had other cool elements, like, again, things you can't do with a GIF file. Like, if you look at my second piece, drop left, there's like a fabric of the space is opening and there are some artworks <laughs> dropping to a pyramid, right? Pyramid is like the market. Uh, it's like a lot of symbolism. I, I try to do a lot of symbolism. And uh, the art pieces are dropping, but uh, it's also, I'm trying to also highlight some sort of... Uh, uh, <laughs> I'm trying to highlight a bit of also the impatience of the collectors and, and how in NFT market, like people are very uh, mm. demanding and, you know, stuff like that. So actually, if you open that piece and wait one hour, another start piece starts dropping as well, like a completely separate piece than what's already dropping. And then if you wait another few hours, there will be another piece that's dropping. And it's, it's, you can only see it if you keep that tab open on your browser for like a few hours. Like you don't otherwise see that piece. And probably like, you know, 0.001% per, of collectors will be interested in this kind of nerdiness. But I like those Easter eggs, like putting those into, the, into those mm-hmm. who like seeing it. Yeah, yeah, it's funny. Yeah. Um, and I think the other, um, the other piece... Like the first piece that you did was sort of like um, an homage to to your wife and yeah. like to your to your daughter being born. Yeah, I thought it was really nice. Yeah, yeah, I did that. Um, yeah, I mean, it's it's like you know, it, we're, you know, I'm of course, you know, I'm I'm really involved, father, and I I love you know my kids being involved, but of course, ultimately, mm-hmm. it's the it's the mother who gives birth and, and does the job really, and mm-hmm. uh, and yeah, my wife. Uh, I asked her to like give me a pose, and and I basically first drew it on paper, and then I uh, took a photo of it. Then I put it on the on the uh, on Inkscape, like it's a, it's a kind of program I use, and then I drew like layered over it with my own drawing, uh, on digital drawing, I mean, and then uh, then I made it, it turned it into a glitch art, 
and yeah, like I, I mean, yeah, my my wife is a good model. She's, uh, I mean, not a model <laughs> officially, but uh, you know. So uh, yeah, that was that was really nice. I also like put nice stuff there as well. Like for example, her heart beats, like I think. Uh, so the baby's heart beats faster than the mother's heart in that piece. So, you know, because yeah. the babies have faster heart. Like lots of, uh, you know, I, I, my wife really loved it. I always also consulted her. Like, for example, the colors are her favorite colors in that piece. Uh, mm. yeah, I didn't, you know, publicly say this before, but yeah, it's kind of right. lots of things that I did together with her. <laughs> wow. You got your, um, yeah. Great husband. Great husband. <laughs> <laughs> I hope, I hope uh, others are listening to that. <laughs> oh, yeah. Hi everyone, if you're enjoying this episode so far, be sure to subscribe, leave a review, share with a friend, and join the Crypto Leftist communities on Discord or Reddit, which you can find links to in the show notes. If you're enjoying the interview or find the content I make important, you can pitch into my efforts starting at $3 a month on patreon.com slash the blockchain socialist to help me out and join the newest patrons like Steven, Jessica, Giraffe Key, and Alexander, which really helps since making this stuff isn't free in terms of money or time. As a patron, you'll get a shout out on an episode like I just did and access to bonus content like Q&A episodes where you can submit and vote on questions you'd like me to answer and I'll give my thoughts in roughly 20 minutes. In the last bonus episode, I gave a review of Vitalik's newest paper that he wrote with Glenn Weil, which described his ideas for decentralized society, which heavily outlines different use cases for what he has called soulbound tokens, which has caused a bit of a stir in the media. In the bonus episode, I review some of the main points from the article, as well as gives my thoughts on some of the good and the bad things that I think are mentioned in the paper, as well as some of the alternatives that have been discussed in crypto world. Of course, I'll still be making free content like this interview to help spread the message that blockchain doesn't need to be used to further entrench capitalist exploitation if we put our efforts into it. So if that message resonates with you, I hope you'll consider helping out. Um, so yeah, I think it's a, it's a really interesting, um, NFT collection. I'm not one, like, I'm not usually into like NFT art as I've, as I've said before, I just tend to be, I'm, I'm more interested in sort of like the people who are doing things really, really differently, mm -hmm. which is why I, I was interested in, for example, Jonathan Mann's collection and then, and then yours as well. And it's also like, I don't know, maybe, maybe it's not, uh, not coincidental that it also tends to be people who are. Um, more left-leaning or, uh, yeah. <laughs> you know, who are more interesting. So. <laughs> yeah, hopefully. Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm talking to a few other leftists for some joint projects, actually. Um, and yeah, they're really creative, let's say. I can say that. I mean, for now, there is nothing materialized, but hopefully we'll do some stuff together. Nice. And do you think, like, if if this goes really well, you'll uh, quit your normal data science job and be an NFT artist? <laughs> I don't know. Slash data, I mean, NFT data scientist. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> NF, NFT space is so speculative, at least for now. I would yeah. love to be a full-time artist. Of course, I would love to. Uh, I guess the way I was raised, with at least in parent, parents, I think I'm more like a bit risk averse, I guess. Um, sure, yeah. So I don't fully plan on quitting, but uh, who knows? Uh, I mean, I would love to. Like, just if it's just up to my desires, yes. But, you know, having two kids and stuff, I also want... I also seek stability, so yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Um, so the other thing that we wanted to talk about is um, the really interesting analysis that you did uh, using your data science skills. I think you released it maybe last year or so. Yeah. Where you compared sort of like the potential inequalities that are created through proof of work versus proof of stake. So this is sort of like you're sort of taking on the critique, especially from Bitcoiners and from and from just crypto critics in general as well, that proof of stake is sort of like this rich get richer scheme and that it, it, it exacerbates inequality um, more than proof of work. Um, and so like you took that on and sort of did your own data science analysis. So I was wondering if you can maybe like walk us through the, the methodology of your study that was sort mm -hmm. of simulating these things. Yeah. So, uh, you know, the obvious upside of having proof of stake, of course, is environmental impact, right? Like we will have a much yeah. cleaner, uh, you know, and environment friendly civil protection mechanism finally. Um, and uh, the criticism that usually comes from the proof of work camp or people who are more leaning towards that is that, you know, proof of work is like, you know, you actually do a work to get things and proof of stake is just, you know, you stake your money and then, you basically have the, you know, it, it re kind of 
it, it's an interest rate almost. So you don't really, you know, do anything. It's a rich gets richer scheme. Um, so right. th- this felt odd to me because, you know, people who actually buy those mining rigs are also doing an investment and it's not like they're actually doing any work. It's that they're setting up a machine and, and that's actually how the, you know, proof of work mechanisms work, mechanism works, right? Like you actually, uh, you know, it solves the computation. Like you're not doing the mathematical computation yourself. It's the machine that's doing it and you basically invest mm-hmm. in it. Actually, a lot of times people don't even buy the mining rig. They, they actually put money into those mining business operators. So, you know, you have your ant pool, you have a foundry, you know, they basically put money into those uh, operations that actually return them the money. So there is, it's really the mechanism or uh, is pretty similar to proof of stake, to be honest with you, for, for a mass majority of the retail space. I think there is a, a theoretical aspect that people consider a lot. People are saying that, well, you can get a mining rig anywhere in the world and it makes it a bit more easier to entry to, to the system, right? Like to the proof of work system. You don't have to own the coin like the the of the native blockchain native coin of the blockchain to actually uh, you know to to earn something from it uh, mm. so so there are some i think there is something to their criticism so i i i acknowledge that but in reality or practically the forces that make that could centralize proof of stake is impacting proof of work exactly the same way because the richer uh, the way that i structured my analysis was that I split the the people into four camps. Say so you have rich staker, so a, a validator who staked a significant amount uh, of the native coin of the blockchain into the proof of stake network. You have a rich miner who also has, who invested in significant amounts uh, to the mining rigs, into the mining rigs in proof of work network. And then you have non-rich staker and non-rich miner or for just the, uh, ease of convenience, let's call it poor staker and poor miner. Mm-hmm. So when you split them into these four groups, uh, like and, and you take a point snapshot like T0 and you look at T1, the, the, the increase in whatever that could help the rich staker will help equally, the in, in percentage terms, it will help equally to poor staker. And whatever that helps rich miner will also, in percentage terms, also help the poor miner. So, and that difference change between rich staker and uh, poor staker will not be more than the rich miner and poor miner eventually. And, and if you actually put it into numbers, I mean, I, I don't know if you want to go into the numbers, but basically this is what happened already. Like in practice, in Bitcoin's lifespan, when you look at the, the mining rigs that operated uh, outside China, especially because China, you know, regulations, there's a lot of uh, volatility. Um, and if you exclude the new ones, their share, their hash rate increased significantly over time. And percentage wise, of course, also like if you exclude the others, it, it increased the similar, similar way. So, so there is, it's no surprise that whatever that happens with proof of stake also happens with proof of, proof of work in terms of percentage gains. Um, yeah. The, the, all, the, there is, although there is an additional element to proof of work, and this is what I try to, you know, highlight to people um, in real life there is economies of scale is has a has a big impact on our lives like uh, you know the, the reason one of the reasons that you know the rich always have better deals one of the reasons why corporations have better deals better tax rates even is because uh, you know of that economies of scale impact and economies of scale impacts not just uh, on the material terms when you're buying for example something in bulk you pay less uh, and when you're, uh, or, or, you know, when your uh, your cost of operations are less when you're uh, doing it in in bulk, but even mm. even politically, right? When you're more powerful, you can influence political figures, and and you know, you get more politically favorable, uh, you know, decisions for you. Mm-hmm. So so there is clearly this example right now in real life. In uh, so in proof of work, we are seeing this happening. Like I, I literally looked at Alibaba and you can see there, like there are offers for like, uh, I don't remember if it was the kilowatts or whatever, but basically between different uh, hashes you get, or d- between different sizes of the mining equipments, you have different prices. Like literally it's right, right there. Like uh, you can see the economy of scale in impacting proof of work network directly, you know, when you're buying it. And this is like what is publicly available. Imagine the level of 
uh, impact that economies of scale has when it's an OTC deal, like uh, on the counter. You know, it's it's even even I think exponentially cheaper for uh, bulk yeah. deals. If you have a ton of money, basically, you can buy a ton of mining rigs for yeah, just like at a huge discount that you can't get in proof of stake. Yeah. So in proof of stake, you have because it's a at least not right now, right? It's a digital realm right now. And uh, it's in the protocol that every stake gets the same percentage of uh, the amount of the like the, mm-hmm. the, the staking rewards. So so you don't have any difference between a, a poor staker or rich staker, other than the fact that they have operation costs. And clearly those operations costs, they also require, of course, Things like you know computers and and, and uh, like just for the validation, it's it's a fraction of what it is in proof of work, but there is some, yeah. and in that operation cost, still the rich ones have an advantage, but the yeah. actual staking reward, there is no difference, and it's because of that, like because it's the same price when you as a rich staker want to buy the native currency of the chain. Or you're a poor uh, staker that you want to buy the native currency of the chain. It's the same price for you, so it's actually you know not going to make any difference. Mm-hmm. Someone on Twitter made a point that you know what if someone wants to buy OTC, OTC native currency. So what if what if you want to buy on the counter ETH or a really sizable amount from some exchange, for example? Wouldn't they sell you cheaper? I've never seen an example of it. Uh, that that is a is a good question though. Like it it might happen. So there might still be some elements of I think, uh, you know, a a veil having a better deal than a uh, a, a poorer, uh, you know, staker. Yeah. Uh, and and that's you know I think we were DMing with you. Like there is an element of uh, you know capitalism getting involved here again. But I would argue that it's much less than proof of work. Right. Yeah. I I I can also imagine that. Coinbase wants to uh, needs to make money fast, and it would just be easier for them to make one large transaction to this whale. But also, partially, the whale wants to not drive up the prices if they're wanting to make a really big purchase, which is why they do it over the counter rather sure. than like through the market. Yeah. So it's also them as a way to get around the increasing costs that they would normally have to incur. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I, I, I honestly, I, I mean, I don't know how that those deals work. So, uh, yeah. it's likely that just the fact that they won't be able to drive the price higher uh, is enough for the exchange to not give additional discount on top of it. So it's actually like the veil has a, at a, is at a disadvantage at the T zero, but uh, maybe you know uh, because that they're doing the OTC deal, maybe the exchange will actually. Not give it cheaper, but just the same price. Because if it would be mm-hmm. all in the open market, it would be more expensive for the whale. So, so I don't know. Uh, I can't really speculate on that part. But uh, yeah, there, I think even if there is, this is probably a much smaller case than it in the case of proof of work. Right. Yeah. I, I would imagine that. I mean, yeah. Like we were talking about earlier. Um, like it's it's sort of, it's it's the physical aspects of proof of work that actually make it more unequal to a certain degree. Yeah. Um, not that because things are digital means that things are egalitarian by any means. Yeah. But um, as far as yeah, it's just uh, being able to to buy in bulk is just such a huge advantage, and so that's why I think we come to the conclusion that like proof of stake is not m- doesn't create more inequality than at least proof of work. But both of them do to some degree because they're both functioning under capitalism and capitalism is a centralizing force anyways. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And uh, one one thing I want to add because uh, you know a lot of pro- proof of work proponents say that but oh but miners, you know, reinvest that money into other things like uh, you know they can take profits mm-hmm. but that assumes that mining operators never reinvest in new mining equipment and it also assumes that stakers never take profits from their stakes mm-hmm. rewards. So it, it, that's a false assumption. It's, it's a false dictum. Dict- like there's no, you know, you have to base your assumptions on equal grounds, essentially. So, uh, so that's why I don't agree with that. And, and another argument is that uh, proof of work, those uh, mining equipment, they become outdated over time. So they have to rebuy those and that's a cost to them. But that applies to the poorer miners as well. So again, like mm. whenever, like all the arguments, I just would suggest or, or uh, really recommend everyone when they're thinking about these, 
they have to think about the equal grounds for the wealthier and poorer participants of both systems to see whether that impact is increasing equally or, or higher in one case or another. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, I think people, if you want to know more about this, definitely check out the um, the mirror post that Chain Left published. I'll link it into the um, into the show description. But I know you got to leave um, since you have another yeah. call. Yeah. So maybe if you want to just leave with people where they can keep with you and maybe find your Art Ponzi collection. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, so. Actually, the easier, easiest way to see all of these, actually, both the article and the, uh, you know, and the collection is that just go to uh, link three chain left. So, you know, uh, that, that will kind of have all of it, essentially. Uh, okay. Yeah. Link, link tr.ee slash chain left or just Google link three chain left. That will also t- 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 take you there. So all of cool. them are linked from there. Yep. Cool. Yeah. So, yeah, be sure to check it out. And yeah, thanks so much, chain left. You are, it's an honor that you are my doppelganger on Twitter <laughs> Same. and I'm really appreciating the, the work that you're doing. And, and I want to thank you for having me, uh, Blockchain Socialist, and also uh, like thank you for doing, doing the work that you're doing. Really appreciate it and, and really enjoying your content and uh, hopefully we'll, uh, we can bridge this gap between, uh, between the, the Web3, let's call it, and, uh, and the leftists and produce use cases that actually help people. For sure. Thank, thank you, you, comrade. Cheers. <laughs> Bye. Thanks for the kind words. See ya.